Well, we have uh, a grandbaby coming into town on the road right now, and uh, no, she's not driving, but uh, her, her parents are, and uh, it's been uh, since her birth, since we've been able to see her, and I was thinking about now that uh, the house will be filled with another little child, I started thinking a little bit about uh, when our girls were, were younger, when they were little, and Patty and I would spend time reading to them, and uh, I would, would recall that one of their favorite books was um, was the book Where's Waldo. Have y'all ever seen the book Where's Waldo? You know, it's a it's a it's a great book. And Martin uh, Martin Hanford um, he actually produced this book. And the interesting thing about it is is on every page there's this really busyness of of a crowded scenes of things that are going on. And somewhere on those pages, you'll catch a glimpse of this little guy, Waldo. He's wearing like a red and white striped shirt and outfit and stuff. And sometimes it's just a little sleeve or it might be his ear or something like that. And I remember trying to sit down and and look at this with our kids when they were younger and, and just sitting there not believing at all that he was on the page. And I love what Hanford does. He actually puts a disclaimer on the very front page says, yes, Waldo is on every page. And I guess he does it for guys like me. And, um, you know, we, we would look at that and we would have an opportunity. And, and there were so many times I never could see Waldo. And the girls would find him real fast and then they would start giggling and they would start having a great time that their dad couldn't find Waldo. And, and sometimes I'd be like, he's not really there. No, he is. And they would just cut up and laugh. And finally I would give in and they'd have to point him out. And sure enough, there was Waldo. Um, he was there, ready, ready to be found. I, I got to thinking about how sometimes our spiritual life is a lot like trying to find where's Waldo. Sometimes we get so mechanical in our spiritual life. Sometimes we get into what I call spiritual maintenance mode. And in those maintenance modes and in those mechanical pieces, uh, we kind of lose sight of where God is, don't we? And when we begin to lose sight of where God is, we're not really sure what the next step or stage of life is. We'll go to bed at night, we'll wake up the next morning, and we'll wake up the next morning not really certain as to what we'll find or not really anticipating anything new that would come, but just knowing that the drudge of the maintenance and the monotony of the next day will come yet once again. And in challenges that come with that is that we begin to become detached of the greater truth of what God has for us. And that is that, that God has promised that the life that he has created for us, the life in which he is engaged, the life in which he uh, has placed before us is a life that is filled with the greatest levels of joy. And the question is whether we will open up our eyes and begin to see and ask, where's Waldo? Is he, is he really there? I was thinking a little bit about some of the challenges that come with this, and sometimes when, when problems come up, when we're in this maintenance mode of our faith, there's not really any great challenges to, uh, to deal with. There's not really a, a crisis in which is before us or, or that, but, but there's really not any spiritual gains either. We're just kind of going along in the blah moment. And sometimes we wake up uh, the next morning and we're not really sure uh, that, that anything good can happen. And if we're not careful, we lose sight of the blessings that are there. Waldo is still present, though. Waldo is there, and, and Waldo is present in the pages of our lives. Excuse my nose there. Waldo is, is present in the stages of our lives, and, and no matter what it is that we're going through, uh, he is there. We can find him, but you know what? We have to do something. We have to stop what we're doing, and we have to look, and we have to open our eyes, and sometimes we really have to concentrate to find where God is in the midst of the normal see or the maintenance of our life and discover that he's right there. But sometimes we're not really apt to finding that he is. And it's in those moments that we begin to start to sense what life is like without God. And what we come to conclude with that is that we have become so accustomed of doing life on our own, doing life our way, making our own decisions, uh, making our choices and moving in that direction that we've kind of spun the need of having God in our life out of that. Armand Nicoli, he writes this. He says, we may ignore, but we cannot evade the presence of God. The world is crowded with him. He walks everywhere incognito. And the incognito is not always easy to penetrate. The real labor is to remember to attend. 
Now, one of the great, greatest challenges in, in, in life is fighting a faith instead of living into the new experiences that God promises to bring before us each day. To live in a faith that runs on maintenance mode. And whenever we're living in that maintenance mode, we begin to sense that we are losing a track of, of, to what God has planned for our life. When life is on spiritual autopilot, the rivers of living water don't seem to, to bring the kind of energy and joy that we have become accustomed to experiencing. When we live a life in maintenance mode, when we live a life on autopilot, this is probably what our life looks like. A couple of things here. We begin to feel like we can't find anything positive in the day. We want to pick out the problems with other people rather than celebrating what good that they're bringing to the equation. We worry about money and we find ourselves obsessing on every, everything that we, that we can think of and never having enough. We use deception towards the truth and we create our own spin on things that just to justify our own perceptions. We pass judgment on people often when secretly we might be jealous of them. And living a spiritual life in maintenance mode is more dangerous than not having a faith at all. Because when we live our lives in maintenance mode, we begin to gradually and quietly destroy the good that God has brought in our midst. We begin to disconnect from that which God has brought that is favor for us. And it mostly involves our inability because of being in maintenance mode of seeing God for who he truly is. Perhaps this is what Jesus meant when he said, in order to see the kingdom of God, we must first become like what? Well, like children. And children are the ones that always can find Waldo. And children are the ones that can get to that particular point. Maybe the real purpose of the gospel message is to be reminded that no matter how ordinary days look like and no matter how our ordinary life might look like, that God always chooses in the midst of our ordinary life, in the midst of our maintenance mode, in the lift of living on autopilot, God always chooses to reveal himself in a powerful way. William Berry says that whether we are aware of it or not, at every moment of our existence, we are encountering God. We're encountering God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who is trying to catch our attention, trying to draw us into a reciprocal, conscious relationship. But I think it begs the question for us, if that is what God is constantly doing, if God is constantly inviting us into this reciprocal relationship, then what about us? We may believe that God reveals himself to us in every day. We may believe that, that God comes to us in, in all those moments. But the question always becomes, and the truth of the matter is this, are we choosing to seek God in every moment of every day? John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, would say that it requires our participation, that we cannot reach that level of, of going into a deeper relationship with God until we choose to engage and turn and to see and to strive toward God as God so lovingly strives towards us. And yet the Bible says, it warns us that we must always call to reach out to God. Isaiah 55, 6. He says, seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. Notice that Isaiah doesn't say, wait until the Lord comes knocking on your door. Notice that Isaiah doesn't say, in a few years, you'll, you'll be able to see that God is there because he'll, he'll not be so busy and he'll place himself in your living room and sit next to you in that nice little recliner. No, he says, do it now, because God is here now. And now is the urgency level that Isaiah calls to that. And it calls us to consider some key questions. When we have a decision to make in life, do we turn first to God for the answer to that decision? When we need comfort in our life, do we find ourselves first turning to God for the comfort that we seek? Or do we turn to the creature comforts for what the world offers? When we find ourselves in a perplexing situation that we just cannot find the answer, do we lean into our own selves and into our own strength and turn it all into a head thing? Or do we surrender that and turn it over to God and turn to him first? 
when we receive a blessing, when we feel that we have been uh, received a miracle, when we feel that we've been cured, when a relationship is being reestablished, when we begin to see the goodness of the things that God has brought into our life, do we first stop and give him praise and thanks? Or do we look it to ourselves? Or merely just cut and run and go off and do what we found ourselves doing before? The question becomes, where is Waldo, so to speak, in these things? And that's what the abundant life is all about. That's that's the purpose of why God created us. God created us to live in a life of abundance. God didn't create us to live in a life of drudgery. He didn't create us to live in a life that, that shrinks in the midst of things, but instead is a life filled with possibilities. He opens his arms to us and he welcomes us as his friends. He helps us to forget things that have happened to us in our past that we would rather just not remember at all. He takes all of these threads of our lives and the brokenness of that and he weaves together a fabric of faith and he presents it to us that we might see the great work that he has brought before us. Luke brings this story into into great um, focus for us. And I want to take us to Luke chapter 17. And specifically, we're going to look at verses 11 through 19. And Luke takes us to a point where, where Jesus finds himself standing in the midst of some people in some really tough situations. They're lepers. And the, the scripture tells us that how Jesus responds who first of all goes to whom, how Jesus responds and what the result is. So I want you to to listen to this and see if you can, as I'm reading the story, I want you to ask yourself, where is God in this? What is the role of the lepers? What is happening to the lepers? And what do the lepers do? On this day, on this way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy, met him. So there's 10, okay? They stood at a distance and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, master, have pity on us. This is what the the law of Moses said. The law of Moses said that if someone had leprosy, first of all, they had to be removed from the general population of the normal community, of the community without leprosy. Lepers were sent to their own place in their own colonies. And whenever a leper saw someone approaching them from a distance, from an eye shot, from probably as far as the eye could see, they had to start by law, shouting at the top of their lungs at that very moment, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, stay away from me, I'm unclean. So you can sense what's happening now in this story. I love that, that, that Luke reminds us that, that Jesus is along the border of Samaria, on that border of Samaria between Jerusalem and Galilee. And if we recall what John tells us about the day at uh, Jacob's well where Jesus meets the Samaritan woman, we know that Samaritans and Jews don't get along. But Jesus is choosing to take not the normal route that one would take between Jerusalem and Galilee, but he specifically travels in the region that puts him near the fringe of Samaria. Now Jesus is standing in the midst of those that are outcasts. And here's where we pick up the story. They say, Master, have pity on us. What it really translates to is, Jesus, heal us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And they went on and they were cleansed. That's what the law of Moses said. When a healing was declared, the one healed must go to the priest. The priest would have to validate the healing. Then the priest would make the determination whether the healed person could return to the community or not, or had to go back into exile, so to speak. And by Jesus saying to these lepers, go see the priest and do it now, he is saying to them, you will be healed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. And he threw himself at Jesus' feet and he thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked, were not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go, your faith has made you well. There's so much happening in this story. And we have to be really careful when we read scripture that we don't just become so familiar with it that we just like breeze over and say, okay, I've got another parable or another story read or I've got another book read, let me close it. Let me move on to the next one. Folks, we must live into the text. 
And that is the importance of how we know that God's word is relevant to us today. Do you notice what's happening? It is the lepers who approach Jesus. Yes, they honored the law of Moses by being at their distance and shouting it out, but somehow the lepers knew that Jesus would be the vessel, the vehicle that the Father would use to provide healing to their lives. That as these lepers looked at Jesus, they knew the answer to where's Waldo? God is here, and he was there to heal them. But notice what it also said in the text. It wasn't until Jesus stopped and looked up to them and saw them that the healing began. Now take a step back with me for a second. There's a message for us in this. We often get into the busyness of life. We get into the maintenance mode of life. We get into that part of our faith where our head is down and we're constantly doing and doing and doing. And we learn from this point what Jesus does, that in the midst of his travels, in the midst of what, where he was going, what he was doing, that he stopped, he cast his eyes up, and he saw. And because of that, the power of God healed these 10 men. And that begs a question for you and me. Are we so busy with our life? Are we so busy doing? Are we so busy in maintenance mode? Are we so busy in our routines that, that we fail to stop and look up and allow a miracle to happen? But the story gets even better. Scholars debate the identity of these 10 lepers. And here's what they come up with. They say nine of the 10 were Jews which meant that these were men and maybe women who believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They should have recognized Jesus at that point, should they not? They should have known that this was the power of God himself who provided the healing to the lepers. But notice what Luke tells us. The nine believers ran after they were healed and never stopped. It was the unbeliever who saw what God had done and stopped and returned to praise him. Do you see the difference? Why is it that it took the non-believer to see the miracle? Why is it that the nine who were believers couldn't see? And I love the three questions that, that Jesus asks um, as he's in this situation. He said, were there not 10 that were made clean? What happened to the other nine? And, and was none of them found to return and give praises to God except this non-believer, this heathen, this foreigner, this Gentile? And I love what it says to us, that we must give thankfulness that God's ministry includes all of us, that all of us are a part of the kingdom's purpose with what's happening here. You see, many people think that the only reason and the only purpose of Jesus' life was to come to earth and die on the cross. That was a great portion of Jesus' mission. If that was the only thing, that we would have never had any documentation of any experiences of his healing miracles. We would have never uh, been a part of his preaching, his teaching, because all those gospels would have said was, Jesus came, he ran to the cross, he was nailed, he died, he was buried in the tomb, and then he rose from the dead. If that was the only purpose, yes, that's a big purpose, but it wasn't the only purpose. And we began to see in the midst of this that so much more is happening. His overall mission, according to Luke, as Luke writes this gospel, is for the believer and even the non-believer to see through the faith of the foreigner, the Samaritan, that even a non-believer can be a part of God's plan of salvation. And in the midst of that, as the Samaritan leper saw what Jesus had done, Jesus said, it is by your faith that you've been healed, but not just physically. Salvation has come. You see, so often we get caught up in this, my only thing that I need to do in life is check the box that when I accept Christ as my Savior, that that's all I have to do because I'm heaven bound. But let me take it a little bit step further and let me push the parameters for us a little bit here. If that were only that which th that Christ required, why would he have prayed the Lord's Prayer? Let's think about that for a second. Let's go back to Jesus' words because I truly believe that God wants us to see something greater than just what the eternal life will bring. Yes, that is very important. Don't misunderstand me. 
But there is more to what it means to be a disciple than simply waiting for eternity. Jesus said, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. A lot of us think that our job is merely to get to the point to say that it is the afterlife destination. And once we have that taken care of, then we can merely no longer thrive and we can merely just want to survive in the life in which he is and wait until the Lord's return and that'll be okay. That's totally missing the gospel message. God wants us to thrive every day. He doesn't want us to merely survive. Jesus never told anybody, and he certainly never told any of his disciples to pray the prayer, take me now so that I can get rid of this life and I can come up there and be with you. He never said that. His prayer was, make up there, come down here, and make things down here run the way that they run up there. That's what he says in the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Make down here be like what it is in heaven and make the way it is in heaven be the way that it is supposed to be down here. Jesus told us not to just believe it, not to just pray, bring heaven down here. He said we must live into that. And Luke's whole point of his gospel message is built upon two things. Here's what they are. Know God and believe in the love of Jesus Christ. And if we can lean into those two things, and if we know God, we know that God doesn't want us to just settle. God wants us because he creates us for greatness in his name. We also see something else come out. God doesn't just reveal himself to us and give us enough of him to make us happy and and deliver us from the daily loneliness of life that comes. And he doesn't give us just enough to get by. But he came here so that you and I could be vessels, we could be connectors of his presence and that we could be that vessel and be that connector with other people, that we could spread that. And that as Jesus did with the lepers, that we would have the strength, the power and the encouragement to stop what we're doing, to open our our eyes to lift them to see those who were there to turn in to see and bring miracle and healing and love to all people. How do we do that? I think it boils down to we have to ask ourselves two questions. Here's the first one. Where do I want to see God's presence and power break into my world? Where do I want to see God rupturing the world and coming and being in the presence and being right here with me? Where where, is it ready to happen? Am I ready for that to happen? Here's the second question. Where would I especially like God to use me to make things down here run the way they run up there? We're not to be complacent. We're not to be on idle. We're not to live a faith of maintenance mode. We're not simply only to secure salvation and then sit on our blessed assurances and do nothing in God's name. We are to be a people living out the faith and bringing the good news. Jesus didn't come just to show us the way. He came like a gardener to show us how to to prune back the hedges of fear, to prune back the suspicions, to prune back the bitterness that so often separates human beings from one another. And when Jesus healed the 10, that was his goal, to bring healing completely. The result is only one got it right. Only one could answer the question. Where's Waldo? And he drops it in your lap and my lap today. And he asks, do you know? Can you see Waldo? 